The following was originally broadcast on Northumberland 89.7 FM. For more podcasts and learn more about us, go to northumberland897.ca. And thank you for downloading this podcast. Welcome to our program, Aging, a New Reality, a show that provides insight into many of the concerns that seniors have during their journey in later years. We talk to experts who will share their knowledge on subjects such as finances, nutrition, housing, and health. It's time to talk to our specialist, Dr. Annabella Bonata, again about climate change and the implications of climate change on our lives, our homes, our families, and actually our our entire infrastructure within our municipalities. Annabella, I would like to talk about increasing weather volatility. You have mentioned that in our previous discussions, how it has always been, these weather patterns have always existed through all of time, but that we're experiencing them at an increased pace and we're experiencing them with greater volatility. Why is that, besides, as you mentioned in our first interview, the CO2 layer that is preventing the heat from moving off the Earth's surface, but how does that explain the ice and the snow and the other, the power to the flooding? How does that CO2 layer explain this volatility? So what it does as the the CO2 layer is not allowing the sun's rays to exit the earth, the earth starts to heat up. And that means different things for different areas across the globe. Maybe in some places where there was already water, there's more water. So it gets wetter, there's more rain events. In areas that it was dry, it's more dry now. And this is, it's due to a bit of a complex system, but warm air can hold more water and our air is warming up. So that's why we're seeing heavier water events. So even like, for example, over winter in, in 2022, 20, 2023 winter, we keep kept hearing about California having these like atmospheric rivers. And that that's pretty new. And they, and they were hit one after the other. And it's because as the air is warmer, it holds much more water and that water needs to be released. So it it works that way. And it also kind of works that way um, in the winter. So in this past winter, again, in 2023, in Southern Ontario, I'm sure everybody kind of noticed a bit less snow, way more ice. So even though we were supposed to get a lot of snow because our temperatures were warmer, that was just becoming ice. So we were getting hit by pretty bad ice storms and getting warnings on these, like the one that we had around Christmas time where we were told, like, don't travel, stay home. With increasing temperature, we still get the same amount maybe of precipitation for that winter, but it's not looking like snow and it used to look like snow and and it'll be ice instead. So that, that's one of the reasons. Ah, interesting. I didn't know that. So the warmer weather actually captures and contains more water. Yes, that's correct. So even in the winter, that water then can turn to ice, and obviously snow as well, but it can turn to ice. And the ice, of course, is more damaging because it weighs more heavily on our on our hydro lines and and power stations, et cetera. So it, and it makes travel terrifying, but I didn't know that. So it's the warmth that is creating this problem of water and more water retention. But like you were saying, other areas where there's drought and has, you know, in the, in the deserts of, of the, of the Western United States and also in, in Western Canada, where they usually have drier periods, do they now have longer drier periods or more dryness? Um, you know, does it, does the drought actually become worse? Yes, absolutely. Um, so that's another thing that is currently happening and is projected to happen. So if you already live in an area that is quite dry, it's projected that it's going to become drier in the future. So this can be explained by, for example, the hot, dry days in the summer. Maybe let's say we used to have 10 before for an entire summer. Now we'll have 30 in that area. So that's going to increase the the situation of drought, of creating material that's dry, which leads to wildfires, making those situations worse in those areas. 
So where you are, whatever extreme you're used to um, experiencing in that area, those are projected to become more impactful and more more frequent. So what does that mean then when Canada relies on the West to produce all of our grain? If they have severe droughts, the ability to produce the grain will be much reduced, I would assume, because they don't really irrigate for, they don't, they don't water their grain crops. What happens to our food supply? And, and, I, and, I, and I know that our West not only supplies Canada, it supplies the world mm-hmm. with grain. Yes, this is a an excellent question, and it's again a huge problem that Canadians working, uh, Canada's working towards resolving now. Um, so I'm starting to see more programs on agriculture and climate change. So it was always kind of treated separately, but now there are uh, different lines of research or jobs coming out that are incorporating climate adaptation, climate change to agriculture. It's a huge issue. As we've seen, we've already gone to the grocery store, for example, with our lettuce. Um, I'm sure everybody experienced that a few months ago. It completely, it either was unavailable or it tripled, quadrupled in price because we couldn't really get it anymore from the States. We were getting it from California because they were experiencing extreme drought. So we couldn't get that. So the, the food supply chain is affected right away. And for farmers in Canada, it means adapting in different ways. One of them could be planting uh, species that are a bit more drought resistant. Yes. Um, And I'm sure there's a lot of research going on for this. What are the best seeds to plant for this projected climate? Because we're talking about today, but this is going to continue Mm -hmm. to become worse. So whatever plants work today or are not working today, we need to make sure that they work for the next maybe, you know, uh, dozens of years and smarter irrigation systems. So some places don't irrigate, but the places that, that do, they need to be more efficient, irrigate at different times of the day. Um, so a lot of research going on around that to help farmers adapt to, to these climate change effects. And in Ontario, and I still want to talk a little bit about our food supply, but in Ontario, we don't seem to have the same drought conditions as they do out west because we are not naturally a province that experiences a lot of drought. What though does climate change, how will climate change affect our agricultural community and our food supply in Ontario? We have lots and lots of fruit trees, um, apple trees, orchards, uh, other kinds of fruit trees in Ontario. We also grow a, a lot of corn for either cattle feed or for ethanol or for other corn bearing products uh, that we use. Um, what what kinds of effects will climate change have on Ontario? So for Ontario, what we started to see and might see is that the trees are flowering at a different time. So this can be particularly sensitive. Um, so if we have heat starting much earlier than it used to, so let's say we have some hotter days around March, around April, then trees are going to start to flower earlier. But then we're still not in the summer, so we can still get frost. And that can completely destroy those flowers, which in turn destroy the production. So there are different ways to prepare, but they're they're kind of more technical. So you might need to wrap the vegetation if there's a frost event coming and you already had flowering occur. It's a bit more difficult to prepare, but that's what we will start to see happen. The production can be impacted by earlier, warmer days. So that's what I would see for, for Ontario. Yeah, I'm also wondering, you know, as we move more and more off land and go into greenhouses, which are which is an expensive way to, to grow food. It, it's just a very expensive way to grow food. But the greenhouses rely on also weather patterns, because if if we have ice storms, for instance, there's breakage. If we have to irrigate constantly and our water supply decreases, that would affect it as well, correct? Yes, yes, you're right. So a drought situation would also affect a greenhouse equally. And we do get a lot of our our vegetables in Ontario from greenhouses. So we rely on them heavily. And as you said, they could be affected by some of these extreme events. So it's finding other sources of food or production. Increasingly so, we're starting to see indoor farms. So for example, vertical farms. But at this point, they don't grow all kinds of vegetables. They're mostly for leafy greens or microgreens. And they're in a great alternative for Canada. They're year round. It's completely housed, but it, it they're not growing everything right now. 
So our reliance on other places to bring our food or even on greenhouses, it's in question now. And we do need to find ways to produce even with climate change occurring so that we don't break that that food supply chain that everybody depends on. Yeah, I think that we noticed the supply chain problem during the pandemic, obviously, but I, I can envision that climate change is going to make supply chains even more difficult to rely on. Supply chains is going to become even more difficult. Just they can't move product. They just can't. They can't produce it and they can't move it. That's, yes. that's the expectation. Yeah. We'll return to our interview right after these messages. You had already talked about power disruptions. What about things like the fact that our stores may be closed? If power disruptions are coming, then the stores can't operate because their debit machines don't work or, you know, people can't get into work. They just can't open. That affects vulnerable people, uh, seniors, uh, an older population as well, because they can't buy any food. Absolutely. So if you have this space, I think you should always be a little bit prepared to rely on yourself for about three days. If you don't have the space, you might have to prepare right before an event occurs. So the first thing that I suggest for everybody to do is to have the Weather Can app on your phone and it you get an alert right away for anything that might happen in your area. And the alerts are built in a way now that at the end, they have recommendations on how to prepare. So for example, with that um, like ice event that we had around Christmas, I got the alert and it said, have water ready in your home. And I, I actually did it. And I went and I bought the, those big jugs of water. I had them ready so that we could have water to drink. You could fill up your bathtub. There are different things that you can do. But when you get those notifications, you, you can prepare ahead of time and have some non-perishable food items in your home, have enough cash on you, charge your cell phones ahead of time, because you need to expect that you might be without energy for three days, but really maybe up to a week. So always have something in your home if you can, but if not, then absolutely before you're already having the warnings that something is coming your way. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the cell phones um, because we are so reliant on cell phones now and even more than a house phone. But if you don't charge your cell phones, they don't work. And so a house phone continues to work, or at least sometimes. So having a, maybe an external charger that you can always have charged up so that, um, you know, you're not going to be out of contact with people. And I think that that's something that vulnerable people really need to think about, uh, especially our senior population, that their cell phones need to be fully charged. And if they don't do that, they need to have a backup charger to make that happen. Yes. I absolutely suggest you always have your phone charge and especially around this time and especially in the winter in southern Ontario which we know what it's like and if you drive I took this advice from my mom always have your tank at more than a half full <laughs> don't let it go lower in the winter especially and that yeah. I live yeah I do too yeah. <laughs> my mother said the same thing yeah. <laughs> It's amazing all the things that we have to think about how do we find that weather can app is it in the app store it's in the App Store. The It's like Environment Canada, the, their weather. So if you just go weather can and Google, it'll come up. But it's it's definitely in the App Store. You put it on your phone. You can check the weather for every day. You can check the, they have the satellite map, which shows you the storms coming. But the warnings are the absolute best part of it. Um, sometimes three days ahead, you have a warning that heat is coming, I, an extreme uh, snow event, extreme rain event. Uh, for everything is there, wind for wind events. So absolutely download that on your phone and you'll get the ping when something's happening. Okay. I was going to ask you if there was a ping or some, you know, siren or something goes off and, and alerts you that, uh, you know, something bad is coming. Yes. Okay. Are rural areas more at risk than urban areas? Absolutely. And again, that's been identified by, by the government of Canada as our vulnerable groups, rural areas. And this is for different reasons. And it's mostly around infrastructure, how far these places are from like emergency response. So the routes, so maybe to reach a home, there's only one road. If that road were to be blocked for several different reasons, uh, hydro line falls, um, flooding, how would you get to that person? So that's one issue, uh, how far they are from hospitals. So really it's about how far you are and what's around you in a rural area. And even as a as a community, again, uh, when I lived in Northumberland County, our neighbors were, I want to say, like half a kilometer away. So if you're incapacitated in any way, it's not that easy for you 
to walk over even and ask for help. It's just because of how remote some of these locations are that they are at greater risk of, of these extreme events. Yeah, I think people forget that. We think we live an idyllic life, uh, you know, that um, it's it's lovely here and it is lovely here. But I think our rural municipalities need to take more, not responsibility so much, but uh, they have. there has to be some impetus now for them to become much more engaged with their population around the issue of climate change and the precautions that we need to take. I know that you've mentioned before um, how to get on your website to find the Intact Center website to find the infographics that we need to use. But what would you suggest that I could suggest to my municipality besides the infographics? What uh, kinds of suggestions can you make to me when I approach our municipality? Yeah, I would say for your municipality, a couple of things. So one is education. So that does go around a little bit the infographics, but making people understand this can happen to you. Be prepared. This is what you can do ahead of time. This is what you can do during an event, post event. Who can you call? Second is that idea of like a vulnerability map. So municipalities should know where the most vulnerable people are in their community so that they can reach out to them. Set up volunteer center where when something occurs, the municipality can contact the people that are most vulnerable. So it's being aware of where they are, when they might need help, and providing that help as quickly as possible. Awesome. I will make sure that I relay all that information, as well as your website, as well as the infographics. Thank you so much. This was another amazing piece of information that people needed to hear. And I think, not that we want to scare people, we want to prepare people. There's a difference. And I think if you're more prepared, you're less scared. So um, thank you so much for spending the time and, and doing this. And I really look forward to our next session when I want to talk a little bit more about heat and heat mm-hmm. events. Thank yes. you so much. Thank you so much. I look forward to it as well. Interviews in this series are conducted by Madeline Corelli, technical assistance by Trevor Joyce, production by Paige Johnston. Executive producer is Barry Walker. The preceding program has been a co-production of Northumberland 89.7 FM and the Community Training and Development Centre.